1 Corinthians chapter 5. So far we have looked at the importance of the church, the identity of the church, the function of the church, and the purity of the church. And in connection with that purity, this morning and tonight we're going to talk about the discipline of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler not even to eat with such a one. But what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you now asking that you would help us to declare your holy word this day. Lord, we just pause to acknowledge that this is your word. And in this word you speak, you have spoken. And so help us, Lord, not to do anything but to unleash what you've written and to set it before your people this morning. Lord, we ask also that you would help us to understand it, that you would enable your people to grasp it, and to take it into our hearts and then to respond to it in a way that would please you. Empower us, Lord, to that end. And we recognize that there are those in our midst who don't know you. You are the one who awakens the dead out of their death. And you are the one who raises people to life joined with your Son. And we ask you this morning, Lord, to allow your gospel to be heard by those who are lost and dead in sins. Lord, raise them to life in Christ. Bring them to faith in your Son. Grant them repentance, Lord, and faith in Jesus. And Lord, what you do in this hour and what you do this day, we will rejoice in and we will give you praise for. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've we've talked the last few times we've been together in this series about the mortification of sin, the need to put sin to death. What we're reminded of in these verses is that the mortification of sin is not just an individual issue. It's a corporate issue. Putting sin to death is not just something you and I do individually. It's something we do together. One of the sad realities of the church in our day is that many people have come to think of the Christian life as a whole as an individual issue. Just an individual issue. It's been labeled many things. I think perhaps the most accurate label is consumerism. 
people have become like a consumer in the spiritual realm. They come to the church, and what they're saying is, what do I want out of a church? I mean, I would like this, and I would like this, and I would like that, and I'm going to visit churches, and I'm going to find what I want in the church. And if the time ever comes that I'm not getting what I want there, that I'm going to go find some other place where I get what I want. You approach the church like you would a restaurant. You approach the church like you would Walmart. You are the consumer. You are in charge. Really, what you're doing is you're living the Christian life as an individual, and you're just looking for what you as an individual want out of a church. The question we've got to ask is, is that what the New Testament envisions? Is that what we see the Christian life described as in the New Testament? And it's not what we find in the New Testament. We don't live the Christian life like a lone ranger by ourselves as an individual. We, we do have an individual walk with God, but God has placed us in a family. We find our place in a corporate setting. We find our place in a relationship to the Lord's church where there's organization and structure and authority and teaching and discipleship and accountability and responsibility, mutual accountability and mutual responsibility. That's the Christian life. It's not lived individually alone. It's lived together in the Lord's church. And one of the responsibilities that we have in the church and one of the accountabilities that we have in the church has to do with sin. We have an accountability to one another and we have a responsibility to one another to help each other put sin to death. That's the church. And this morning we're going to see that. There there are no better verses to learn that than the verses we have before us this morning. There are many places you see that truth in the New Testament, but it is so clear in these verses. And we're not going to have time this morning to, to delve into these verses in great detail. So rather what I thought we would do is have an over, sort, of, sort of a flyover and look at it in general terms. And there are three things that I wish to do this morning. First of all, we're going to make some general observations together, some things that we just see on the surface that are here to observe. Second, we're going to, to draw from that some general lessons. And then third, I want to close with some exhortations. So general observations, general lessons, closing exhortations. Now we begin this morning with some general observations. The first observation is this. This instruction, Paul's giving to the Corinthian church here, this instruction was necessary because of blatant sin in the congregation at Corinth. Why is he writing this? Because there is blatant sin, unmistakable Undeniable, undebatable sin going on in the congregation at Corinth. There is a man who is in a sexual relationship, a we might say a romantic relationship with his stepmother. Now, whether this was a divorce situation or whether this was a, a death situation and now this man is linked up with his stepmother, we're not told all of that. What we know is it is... Gross sexual immorality. Verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Highly doubtful that it's talking about his birth mother, much more likely talking about his stepmother. So that's the first observation. You have blatant sin going on in the congregation at Corinth. Second observation The sin issue being dealt with here was known to the congregation. Paul is not just now unveiling this. He's not taking the lid off of it in this letter. They are already aware of it. In fact, he says in verse 2, they are arrogant about it. He says in verse 6, they are boasting about how they're responding to it. He says in verse 1, It's actually reported. So not only is it known within the congregation, I think there's a high likelihood this is also known outside the congregation. In fact, he says in verse 1 that this sexual immorality is of a kind that not even pagans tolerate it. Isn't it sad when the morality of the church sinks lower than the morality of the culture. I mean, when the church has things going on within it that don't even go on outside of it, 
not even tolerated by pagans, but tolerated in the church. It's a sad day. So you have blatant sin going on within the congregation, and the sin is known. It's not a secret. Probably known outside the church, too. There's a third general observation. This instruction was necessary because the church was not taking action regarding the sin issue. That's why he has to write this, because the church is not doing anything about it. Now, as you read these verses, what is Paul calling upon the church to do here? What, what, what would the Lord Jesus want this church to do? He says, get the man out of there. Get him out of the fellowship. Right? In fact, he says at the very end of this section, verse 13, purge the evil person from among you. Get him out. Now, we're not told all the details that go into to the background of this. We know from Matthew chapter 18, there are steps that we take in church discipline, right? First, you go one on one. And if you win your brother or sister one on one, the matter ends there. If there's repentance, genuine repentance, end of the issue, right? One on one. If they won't listen one on one, what do you do? You go with two or three, right? In fact, one of the most misquoted verses in the New Testament is found in Matthew chapter 18, which is where two or three are gathered together, there am I in their midst. Now, how is that most oftentimes used when you have a low turnout at church, right? And someone says, but after all, the Lord is with us because where there are two or three gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of his people. But that's not what those verses are talking about at all. It is a promise with respect to church discipline. The Lord Jesus is telling us, listen, when you are acting in my name with my truth, when you're doing the right thing for the right reason, I want you to be assured I am there. When you have to go with two or three to confront a sin issue, I want you to know you don't go alone. I want you to know I'm present. I am with you. You are acting in accordance with my wishes, with my will. So you go one-on-one. -on -one. If they won't listen, you go with two or three. If they listen when there are two or three, end of the issue. Praise the Lord. We've won our brother. There's repentance. That's all you want. If this is loving, the purpose is always for restoration. It's not to embarrass. It's not to expose. It is that you love your brother or sister and you want to save them from the destruction of sin. You're helping them put sin to death. So you go with two or three. If they won't listen to the two or three, then what do you do? You tell the church. And the entire church says to the person, we call upon you to submit to God's word. We call upon you to repent of your sins. Again, it is loving them. If there is repentance, then there's forgiveness and there's an embrace and there's a welcome by the fellowship. The, the entire purpose is restorative. It is, it is salvific. It is to save that's the reason why the church acts. But if they will not listen to the church, then what do you do? You put them out, don't you? Then you put them out. So the fact that he's calling for this man to be put out of the fellowship, I think, says to us that this man has already been confronted with his sin at some level. And the church has already been instructed as to what it should do. In fact, look at verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. So there's been a prior letter and there's already been some instruction. And Paul has already told them, you must stop associating with sexually immoral people. It also seems that they had perverted his letter or misunderstood his letter. Because he has to clarify here, I'm not talking about not associating with the sexually immoral who are lost out there in the world. I'm talking about how you're to respond to sexual immorality in the fellowship, in the church. That's what I was writing about. So the reason why this instruction is necessary is because the church is not acting on the truth. It is not taking action. The sin has been identified. The sinful man has been confronted. The church has been instructed, but no final action has taken place. Leads to a fourth general observation. 
the church here is being commanded to do what needs to be done. What is Paul calling for here? He is calling for action. Verse 3, for though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What does Paul mean when I'm present with you and all of that? I think to give the sense of it would be something like this. Have you ever have you ever seen something that needed to be done? You've told the people in who have the responsibility to do it how it is to be done. They have all the instruction they need, but they just continue to refuse to do it. What do you feel like in those situations? You feel like going to them, taking them by the arm, And saying, if you won't do it by yourself, let me do it with you. Right? And Paul is saying, listen, you have the instruction. You know the situation. You know what needs to be done. So how about this? I am with you in spirit. I'm going to be absent bodily, but I'm with you. And if you don't want to pronounce the judgment, I've already pronounced the judgment. As if present. I've pronounced the judgment. Now go do what the Lord has told you to do. When you gather together, I'll be there with you. I've pronounced the judgment. Now take action. He says down in verse 11, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed, he wants to make plain. It's not just this issue. It has to do with sin issues. Whether it's sexual immorality or it's greed or it's idolatry or it's reviling or it's drunkenness or it's swindling. You're to deal with these issues. He says, not even to eat with such a one. For what advice to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? By the way, that sure throws a wrench in the use of uh, Matthew 7 by many Christians, doesn't it? No one is supposed to judge me. You ever heard that? Well, what does he say here? Where is judgment appropriate? Inside the church. If you name the name brother, if you take your place among God's people in the fellowship of God's people, in the body of Christ, visible and local, you take a place of mutual accountability and responsibility and sin is judged in the church. So he's calling for action. There's a fifth general observation, and the last one I'll mention this morning, and that is I want you to see that the action that he calls for here will be deemed by many, especially in our generation, will be deemed by many to be severe. I mean, when it comes to the place where they take action, what do you do with this man? He is to be put out of the fellowship, and no one is to associate with him anymore. I mean, not even supposed to have a meal with him. I can't tell you how many times in the years that I've spent in ministry that I've seen a situation where a person, sadly, it breaks your heart. You don't want to ever see it come to this, but they refuse discipline on every level, one-on-one, two or three, and finally they will not even hear the church And the church has to take action, and they're put out of the fellowship. And two weeks later, after a Sunday night service, you walk into a Denny's, perhaps, and there you have a church member sitting down and having dinner with the person who's just been disfellowshipped. What has the church accomplished when that happens? Nothing. The point is, he is to be disfellowshipped. He is put away from the fellowship of God's people. He is delivered to another realm We'll talk about that in a moment. So, we see these things, don't we? Just on the surface of the text. This is a blatant sin issue. And and, and we want to emphasize that. It is blatant. It is known to the congregation. In fact, it was probably known outside the congregation. It was a situation where the church knew what to do. 
They've been given instruction. The man has been confronted, but they were refusing to take final action. So Paul is commanding them to do what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is severe. Now, what do we learn from this? Let's talk about some general lessons. Lesson number one, sin is not just an individual issue, is it? In this age of individualism, we're reminded right here that sin is not just an individual issue. Why is this being addressed to the congregation? I want you to notice something. This instruction is not addressed to the man, is it? It's not addressed to the man who's in sin. He's mentioned, his sin is identified, but this instruction is not to the man. The instruction is to the congregation. Why? Because the man's sin is not just between him and the woman and God. The man's sin is a matter that the whole congregation has authority to deal with, the authority of the head of the church, the authority of the chief shepherd of the church, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the right and the responsibility to deal with sin corporately. Right away, we just need to stop and let that sink in. I want to ask you, professing brother or sister, Do you take the attitude that says, no one has a right to address sin in my life? Do you take an attitude that says, you know what? My sin is between me and God. It's none of your business. Because this passage says, if that's your attitude, your attitude's wrong. If that's your expectation, your expectation is shattered by Scripture. When you join a church your brother or sister, and you profess the name of Christ, sin is not just an individual issue. It's not just between you and God. It involves the body. Do you believe that you can live in sin? I'm talking about, and we'll talk, I'm going to qualify it in a moment. Do you believe you can live in sin and it has no effect on the church? Any more than you can live in sin and it has no effect on your family, no effect on the people connected with you. But let's reverse that for just a moment and ask another question. Every professing brother or sister in this place, have you come to the place in your attitude where you say, am I my brother's keeper? I mean, that's between him or her and the Lord. It's none of my business. Who am I to say anything? Who am I to do anything? Because this passage addresses that too, doesn't it? Someone needed to take action here. They weren't doing it. These are the people being addressed, the people doing nothing. Now, let's be, let's be cautious and accurate here with a few thoughts. First of all, we want to make the point this is a clear sin issue. This is not a matter of conscience. This is not a matter of personal liberty. This is not an area where you have an opinion about something. This is something clearly defined as sin in Scripture. Second, this is a persistent sin issue. This was ongoing. This was something not being dealt with, not being repented of. Persistence in sin is when it must be disciplined, it must be addressed. Third, this is an ignored sin issue. That is, the person has been warned, has been addressed, and they continue to refuse to heed the warnings. Fourth, this is a known sin issue. What I'm trying to caution us against is the church is not to be a place where each of us becomes a spiritual spy. And we're, we have this this critical spirit, and we have this desire to search out sin in one another, and we're looking for a reason to get involved in one another's life when it comes to sin. That's not the attitude being taught here at all. This is not where I have you know, a personal opinion about something, and you're not living up to my personal opinion, and so I'm going to discipline you. No, that's not what's being taught here. Nor is it a situation where I see you stumble and immediately, I mean, even if it is a clear sin issue, I see you stumble and immediately I'm ready to jump on this situation in your life. The book of James says we all stumble in many ways, don't we? 
Now, this is persistence in sin. This is a clear sin issue. He's been warned. He won't listen to it. It's known. There's no hiding it. Sin is not just an individual issue. It's a corporate issue. Second general lesson, sin is a serious issue. I mean, if nothing else is plain in these verses, it is plain that the reason why the church at Corinth has not taken action is because they have not believed God about how serious sin is. They are not treating this situation for the serious issue that it is. The words that he uses here, powerful. He says this church should have been shocked. You notice how he puts it in verse 1? It is actually reported. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't believe what's been reported to me. I am shocked. I am astounded by what you're allowing to go on in your midst. If he's shocked, if the pagans are even shocked, should not the church be shocked? Where is the church at when sin no longer astounds us? The church should have a spiritual sensitivity to sin that means that we do not lose our proper sense of outrage against it. Do we anymore know what it is to be outraged by sin? I mean, in a proper way, in a humble way, in a God-glorifying way, to be astounded by sin. The church should have been shocked. The church should have been grieved. Verse 2. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Where is your broken heart? Not only should you be shocked by what this man is doing with his stepmother, it should break your heart for him, for her, for what this means to the life of the church. Sin should not only bring forth the church's indignation, sin should bring forth the church's sorrow. Are we sorrowful over sin? Does it break our hearts? Do we weep over it? We should. The church should have been moved to action. They sit still. They do nothing. Serious matters require action. Serious matters require that we take steps before it gets more serious. So, not only is sin not just an individual issue, it's a corporate issue. It's a serious issue. The church must not take it lightly. We must be astounded by sin. We must grieve over sin. We must act against it. There's a third general lesson. Sin is not just an individual issue. Sin is a serious issue. Third general lesson is this. Sin is a stewardship issue. Sin is a stewardship issue. What what do we mean by that? I mean that when we recognize that the church is not ours, that the church is the Lord's, then we will deal with sin in a way that reflects that. If the church belongs to Christ, if the church is the Lord's, then we don't have a right to deal with sin in our midst just any way we want to. If the church is the Lord's, and it is, then we have a responsibility to deal with sin in our midst according to His instructions. Do you notice how it is emphasized in these verses that this is a stewardship issue? Notice whose name they're going to assemble in to take action. Verse 4, when you are assembled, in whose name? In the name of the Lord Jesus. So you're going to deal with this, he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus. You're going to gather in the name of Christ. You're acting on Christ's behalf. Notice whose power is represented, will be at work when we take action. Verse 4. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. His authority 
His power is at work in the discipline of the church. It's in His name, in His presence. It's in His authority. Notice what realm the offender leaves and what realm the offender enters when we take action. When someone is put out of the church, verse 5, he is delivered to Satan. What does that mean? If the church is the Lord's and if the Lord dwells in his people, then this is the realm of the spirit. This is the realm of Christ. And when the man is placed outside the fellowship, outside the fellowship of God's people, he is delivered physically into the realm of Satan. Where if that man is saved, there is going to be physical discipline, spiritual discipline that comes upon his life prayerfully leading that man to the place of repentance, or it's even possible that the person will die physically and their spirit saved in the day of the Lord. Has it ever happened that someone has refused the discipline of the church and died as a result? Has it ever happened that the Lord has disciplined someone with death? What's the answer? Yes. So we assemble in the name of Christ. The authority of Christ is represented. He leaves the realm of Christ, the spirit, physically speaking, and enters the realm of Satan. Notice what day we take into account when we do this. Verse 5, you're to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in what day? In the day of the Lord. We're looking to the day of the Lord. We're understanding the eternal realities of these things. This is not something light. This is the most serious issue in the world. We're talking about the day of the Lord. You see, this is a stewardship issue. This, this is, the church is not, does not belong to man. We are the Lord's blood bought to be structured and organized according to his instructions and to function according to his instructions. That means dealing with sin in our midst according to his instructions. Not just free to do whatever we want to do. And you notice why we can't leave sin alone? Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Sin is compared to leaven. It spreads. It spreads. And if you leave sin alone in a congregation, if we don't mortify sin in our own life, and if we don't help one another mortify sin as a body, what happens is sin doesn't sit still. It spreads. It spreads. Also notice, if you talk about a stewardship issue, notice that this discipline is limited to those in the membership. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. You don't go to your next door neighbor's house who's not a member of the church, who's not a believer, and say, I, I, I think you're being unfaithful to your wife. I mean, you may do that on a friendship level, but it's not church discipline. You know, when you go back to the 1980s, the moral majority and all of that, isn't it amazing that the church is, we're out there marching and protesting and picketing and doing all this sort of thing. That is not, if you do that as a citizen, that's one thing. But we don't do that as the church because we're not here to discipline the world. The discipline takes place amongst those people who name the name of Christ. Sinners live in sin. We're not surprised by that. But believers are to depart from sin. We still sin in many ways. But we ought not to persist in known sin. Known sin must be put away. In fact, notice how he puts it in verse 10. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. And then he nails it down with this. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? 
Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. So where does discipline occur? In the church. This is not only not an individual issue, a corporate issue. This is not only a serious issue. This is a stewardship issue. We are the Lord's and we're to deal with this according to the Lord's instructions. Leads to a fourth general lesson. Sin in our midst reveals our spiritual condition as congregations. And let me ask you a question, church. I know you know the answer to this, but I want you to think with me. Is there a sinless church on this side of heaven? How about this church? Is it sinless? We're a perfect church, aren't we? Doesn't exist, does it? All right. That means we're going to deal with sin issues in our midst, aren't we? Are we going to have, as a church, are we going to have to deal with sin? All right. Why does the Lord, let me ask another question, is God sovereign? Do we face these issues under the umbrella of the sovereignty of God? Does he allow things to come to the surface at certain times with certain individuals and and those, those circumstances test us as a congregation? Does that happen in the sovereignty of God? Sure does. First Corinthians eleven nineteen. Listen to this. For their his same letter, same congregation. First Corinthians eleven nineteen. For there must be factions among you, in order that it's a purpose statement. In order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Paul says one of the reasons why these issues are coming up is so that those who are genuine among you may stand out. The way you respond to this is going to say something about you. So that whenever we face sin issues, we're tested as a, as a fellowship. We're going to learn something about ourselves. Now, what do you learn about the church at Corinth here? You learn that they had a completely misguided view of themselves. They, how were they responding to this? In a shameful way. But they were glorying in their shame. He says in verse 2, you are arrogant. He says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. So he says they were guilty of great arrogance and they were boasting in it, which revealed their ignorance. What was revealed about this church? Well, one thing, sinful toleration. He says, it's reported there's sexual immorality among you, verse 1, of a kind that's not even tolerated among pagans. Pagans wouldn't tolerate this, but you are. Church, there are things that we are not to tolerate. We're not to tolerate. They were guilty of tolerating it. Sinful toleration. Toleration. I wonder, I'm not talking now just about our church. Just look at the church of our generation. Are there things being tolerated that ought not to be? Sinful toleration. But at the same time, sinful exaltation. Because they are boasting in what they're tolerating. Now, how could that be? How could you be tolerating something that dishonors God, that displeases God, and you feel big about it? You feel arrogant about it. In fact, you're boasting about it. How could that happen? Well, a completely skewed view of themselves. We've seen it, haven't we? We see how this could happen. Let me, let me give you some ways this could be happening. First of all, they imagine that they're loving the man. Well, you know, we're just loving him. We hope to love him out of this. We, we're not saying this is right. We know even pagans wouldn't tolerate this, but that's why we're the church. Because we're going to love him when other people wouldn't love him. Come here. Everybody's welcome. Doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter what you're engaged in. We're going to love you. In fact, we're going to be an oasis of love. Imagine love. Imagine grace. This is just grace. We're going to show this man grace. We know what he's doing is intolerable, but that's why we're the church, because we're going to show grace to this man. 
imagined patience. Now listen, we know this isn't right, and we know that eventually this would have to be dealt with. But we just feel like what's called for in this situation right now is just to be patient with him. We've spoken to him. He knows what he's doing is wrong. We're going to give him some time to deal with it. We're going to be patient. Imagined wisdom. We know, Paul, we know what Matthew 18 says about this. Some church might today say today, we know the steps of church discipline. We're, we're just not sure in this culture, in this day and age, we're just not sure this is wise. Just not sure it's wise. So we're acting in a wise fashion, you see, when we don't do anything about it. And on and on it could go. Wisdom, love, grace, patience. Paul has no patience with that, does he? He says, take action. It's going to test us. Sin is going to test us as a fellowship. Will we obey the Lord? Will we obey him? There's something else revealed about this church. Not only were they sinful toleration, sinful exaltation, but sinful ignorance was unveiled. Their ignorance. They're ignorant concerning the power of sin. They don't know this is going to spread like leaven. They're ignorant concerning the nature of their new life. He says in verses 7 and 8, don't you understand you're a new lump? You're an unleavened loaf. <laughs> Celebrate the festival, verse 8, not with the old leaven, not like your old life, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is your new life in Christ. Live in accordance with it. They're ignorant of the nature of spiritual separation, verses 9 through 11. Here they are trying to separate from the world. They're not even dealing with sin in their midst. It's just the opposite. We live in a sinful world. Can't get out of it. But in the church is where we judge sin. They're ignorant concerning the realm for judgment, verses 12 and 13. We are to judge those inside. So sin in our midst reveals spiritual issues. Sin is not just an individual issue. Sin is a serious issue. Sin is a stewardship issue. Sin in our midst is going to tell us something about where we are spiritually. Which gets to the fifth general lesson. Sin, and I've said this, but I want to underscore it. Sin is something to be dealt with according to God's instructions. So how do we deal with it? If you, if you take everything that he gives us here, how do you deal with it? First of all, you mourn over it. You mourn over it. Second, you humbly submit to God's will. Do you notice he says they're arrogant? What is the humble thing to do? Obey Christ. Humbly submit to the will of God. Third, if it's necessary, remove an unrepentant member. As you do this, fourth, recognize God's presence and his power throughout. We're acting in the name of Christ, in the presence of Christ, on the authority of Christ, in view of the day of Christ. Delivering one from the presence of Christ into the realm of Satan. Recognize God's presence and power. You do this, verses 6 through 11, to protect the body. Any so called brother. If he names the name of Christ, if he's called a brother, we deal with this man recognizing he may not be a brother. We do this to save him. We do this loving the person that we discipline. We do it to save them. We're doing it in view of the day of the Lord. And if necessary, and this comes to this point, then we isolate them. An obedient isolation of the offender. That's what we learn here. Now let me finish this morning with some closing exhortations. We've seen observations, lessons, now some exhortations. First of all, let us all judge ourselves. Let's begin there. Let's judge sin in our own life. 1 Corinthians 11.28 says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. 
Same letter, same church. And he says, you know why some of you are weak, sick, some have died? Because you're not judging your own sin. And at the Lord's table, before you take the Lord's Supper, you, first of all, need to examine your life for sin. And wherever the Lord reveals sin to you, you need to deal with it. And if you would judge yourselves rightly, you would not be judged by the Lord. Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Where do we tend to begin? We tend to begin with our brother. Let me take that speck out of your eye, that splinter. And what we don't see is we have a log in our own. So the first exhortation is this. Before we try to deal with one another, let's deal with ourselves. Let's examine ourselves. Let's judge ourselves. Let's, let's listen to the Lord. Listen to the Word of God. Listen to the Spirit of God as He convicts us of sin. And let's deal with sin in our own lives. Second exhortation, let us love each other. That is, even if we do deal with each other's sin, let us do it loving each other in a gentle way. In a humble way, listen to Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So even when we do deal with sin in each other's lives, we never come saying, now let me tell you how to do it. Let me tell you how I've got it all together. Let me tell you what's wrong in your life. No, rather we come gently. Brother, I love you, and I see that you're on a course that's hurting you and will hurt you worse if you continue on it. And I want to help you even as I want you to help me to walk obediently to Christ in this matter. And here's what the Word of God says about what you're engaged in. Gently, lovingly, humbly, in a self-examining fashion. That's how we deal with each other. Third, let us receive each other. If someone loves us enough to approach us with a concern, we ought to receive him or her in a spirit that says, I will listen to you. In other words, with an open, honest heart. Are we willing to be honest with ourselves? Are we willing to deal with the sin that's in our lives? Do we, do we appreciate it when someone comes to us? Do we thank them for it? Or do we resent it? Do we immediately go into defense mode? Or do we receive it? Let us judge ourselves. Let us love each other. Let us receive each other. Fourth, let us help each other. You see, it's not going to always be confrontational. It's not going to always be that we're dealing with known sin in each other's lives. In other words, what I'm saying in this fourth point is we just need to be exhorting each other every day. I mean, in a positive way. Hebrews 3.13 says, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is always that enemy that's out there. So we need to be encouraging each other every day to walk with Christ, to walk in obedience to the word of God. By the way, where do we do that? Here. Here. Why is it important not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which is the manner of some? Why is it important to be here when the church gathers? This is where you are exhorted to walk in obedience to the word of God and to forsake sin. And we're to be doing that not just from a pulpit, but individually encouraging each other as long as it's called today. Understanding that sin hardens and sin deceives and sin kills. It's amazing and it's sad, isn't it? That some people's answer for sin issues is just to pull away from people. Well, my answer is, you know, I just don't hang around those people. I'm not talking now about sinful relationships. I'm talking about the church. 
I'm talking about your brothers and sisters. Well, I just sort of live an isolated existence as an individual because it's just easier than to deal with people. Well, you're a people. And you're difficult too. And you know what? This is how we grow. Iron sharpens iron. This is how we grow. Help each other. And the final thing I would say exhorting us is, let's obey Christ. Let's obey the Lord Jesus. Let's obey our Father in heaven. Let's obey the leadership of the Spirit. Let's walk submitted to the Word of God. Let us submit. Lost people rebel. Saved people submit. And so let us humbly submit to the truth and walk in it. And all God's people would say, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we have heard your truth today. We've seen it. Now I pray that we, your people, would submit to it. I pray, Lord, that wherever you put your finger on an area of sin in our lives this day, where we're aware of it, I pray that we would be obedient to you this moment. In whatever area that is. If it's at home, if it's with our children, if it's with a brother or sister here in this fellowship, if it's how we're dealing with a lost and dying world, misunderstanding our relationship to it, whatever, wherever it is, Lord, if it's just an individual issue in our own hearts and thoughts and lives, wherever you allowed us to see our sin, I pray that we would humbly submit to you and obey you in the power of your Spirit in that, in that matter. Where we need to forgive, Lord, I pray that we would forgive Where we need to ask for forgiveness, Lord, I pray that we would ask for it. And I continue, Lord, to ask on behalf of those who are not inside the church, from a spiritual point of view, they may be sitting here, but they're outside the fellowship of the Father and the Son and His people. Oh, Lord, help them, I pray, to recognize their spiritually dead condition and their need for the life that's found only in your Son, and save them. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.